Welcome to this uh, introduction course on uh, combustion. Uh, my name is Thierry Poinceau and you can find me at this address if you need to ask questions for this course. Uh, combustion is uh, an interesting science and uh, probably many of you have uh, heard about combustion before but never realized how important it is for, for our society today. So there is a simple, uh, a simple point about combustion is that 90% of the energy on Earth today is produced by combustion. Every time you get one watt somewhere on this Earth, it's by burning something. Something could be hydrogen in a very sophisticated uh, rocket engine, for example, but it can be also just burning uh, wood to get uh, some hot water if you live in Africa. Whatever you do, it's always with combustion. So it's really the first uh, engine in our society. So if you would suppress combustion, you can t there's a small list here of things you would have to live without, and you can see that it would be very difficult to live, actually. The whole society would collapse if combustion would stop tomorrow. Just a few examples. All of you know about satellites, but you know satellite is basically first a combustion uh, fact. It's uh, this kind of things you need to propel satellites up to the place where you need them. Combustion is also this kind of things which is uh, not only useful for a society, it's also a lot of fun. This is the simplest example of where you can have fun with if, you are an, if you are an engineer. So these pictures give you an idea of the power which you can find in an engine like this. By the way, those are French engines. Everywhere here, you find combustion. The rule for such an engine is simple. It has the power of a nuclear power plant in the volume of a car engine. Of course, uh, it lasts not very long, usually 200 seconds, and that's the end of the story. But still, uh, this is the kind of funny things you can do when you work on combustion. Now, combustion, those are other pictures here. Those are normal operations, and you can see how important it is here to, to master the process which leads to this kind of power. Uh, sometimes these things get out of control. You will see a picture in a few seconds where things don't burn the way they should. So, now, this is normal, okay? You're going to see something which is not normal in a few seconds. And... Uh, this one, for example, now this is not what should happen. This explains why everyone is sitting about 200 meters away from the rocket when you start it. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this course on military applications, but obviously military, army, every, everything there is about combustion. Rockets, missiles, bombs, everything here would not exist without combustion. That would be a good thing, but you don't have a choice. So the, the aircraft of today, the aircraft of tomorrow, and uh, even the famous problem of terrorism, you hear about this every day now. You know, it's not that it's difficult to do a bomb, but what is difficult is to send it where you want it to go. And that's much more difficult. And it's, again, a combustion problem. So I will for forget now about army applications. Just come back to your everyday life. So uh, I want you to remember two basic equations in that field. The first equation is the following one. There will be equations in this course. Uh, today, there will be only simple equations. But after that, you will see much more equations. But uh, the simplest one is that the energy on Earth today is combustion. And I think most of you realize that. What you don't realize is that the energy on Earth tomorrow will also be combustion. Um, it is clear that renewable energies, you hear about wind and sun every day, they will replace combustion. But that will take a very, very long time. You will probably be retired by the time this happens. And also, they will not be able to replace combustion for everything. You cannot propel an aircraft with sun or wind. This will never happen, whatever you do. So for a long, long time, combustion will remain the first energy source, whatever we do. Just to give you an example here, this is the, the, the way we, they produce uh, electricity in the United States today. And if you look here at the natural gas plus the coal, uh, it's one, more than half of the energy is obtained by burning something. And the renewable energies here are very small, about 4% or something like this. So in France, it's a little bit more. It's more like 10. Uh, so these things will increase, and they will increase fast. The market for renewable energies grows extremely fast. 
The problem is that it's very small today, and the problem is that the global demand for energy grows faster, which means that in the future, not only the renewable energy are going to grow, but combustion also will grow. We'll build more and more power plants using combustion as an energy. For example, the market for gas turbines keeps growing all the time. So it's very important to realize that the, the business for combustion will be there and you will be retired by the time it stops. So our problem now in terms of uh, combustion science is that we must allow this to happen without increasing the emissions, without wasting fossil fuels, and of course without making climate change worse. Because as you know, combustion is the source of a significant number of problems here. Pollution, you heard about that before. Uh, this is something that uh, we've been working on for a long time in the combustion community. And of course, uh, we cannot live with that. If we keep increasing combustion without limiting pollution, we'll be in bad shape. This is uh, coming from Toulouse, actually. Uh, this kind of pictures is not something we like to see in Toulouse, where we build aircrafts. Uh, so, but the question is a valid question. Is it possible that we are, for example, changing the climate because we are flying? And that's, uh, that's something we also need to understand. And combustion extends beyond the engine. We also need to know what our engines are doing to the to climate. For example, this is a picture taken also in Toulouse. You know that aircraft leave contrails behind them. Contrails are like little clouds here, but these clouds can grow. And in certain parts of the world, at certain times of the day, more than 50% of the cloud comes from aircraft. And um, an interesting question was, does this change climate? To, to, to do that, it's very difficult. And uh, one experiment that you have to do to make sure is to stop aircraft for a long time. Of course, you cannot do that except in certain circumstances. For example, after uh, September 11, there was no aircraft in the United States for three days. And during these three days, they, were, they observed, this could be due to random fluctuation, but still they observed very large, much larger difference of temperatures between the day and the night. So this is a suggestion that when you put all these aircraft uh, in the sky, you modify the cloud, and so you modify the climate. So you see commission science goes from uh, outside the engine and also, of course, I'm going to talk a lot about that, about inside the engines. And uh, this is what we need to master. This is what I'm going to try to, to teach here. So pollutants. There are two main types of pollutants. In this course, we're going to burn a lot of hydrocarbons. So it's uh, molecules where you find N carbon and MH atoms. You burn them with oxygen. It gives you CO2, water and a few other things here. These things here are the things that can be avoided. CXHY is an hydrocarbon which you did not burn completely. This kind of things you smell on an, air on an airport, for example, kerosene. CO, NO, all these things are due to a combustion which is not perfect. And so those can be avoided. They should be avoided. CO, for example, would just kill you if you, if you uh, have too much of uh, CO in a room, you're going to die in a short time. So of course you must avoid it. Uh, and this, the progress here has been impressive in the last 30 years. And 10 years ago, the, the objective was to diminish those things. Now the objective is different. We also want to diminish CO2 and H2O. CO2 and H2O, <coughs> if you burn hydrocarbon, one molecule of that will necessarily give you N molecule of CO2. You cannot avoid that. So the only way to decrease now the emissions of CO2 and water is to maximize efficiency. That means we need to build engines which consume as little as possible of hydrocarbon if we want to, to, to minimize the impact on climate. Because CO2, of course, is the main problem for climate. And the progress in the combustion field has been huge in the last 20 years. In the field of piston engines, for example, the efficiency has increased by a factor of two. Now, I see a lot of people, especially young people like you, wondering about if I'm doing combustion work, am I doing something dirty? You know, it's just the opposite. Today, if you want to do something useful for the planet, you need to work on combustion because combustion will be here for a long, long time. There's just no way to avoid it. Well, there is one way to avoid it. You can stop driving, you can stop flying, you can stop heating your house, and you can stop uh, eating also. You can stop a lot of things. If you do that, you don't need combustion. If you want to continue living like you do, there's no, there's just no other way. So we need to work on combustion because it has a very strong impact on society. And also because today it's a very sophisticated technology, so we need a lot of engineers. This is why you are here. <coughs> now, combustion is also politics. Uh, 
uh, this is an example here of uh, the years and the regulations giving you the amount of CO2 per kilometer in a typical car. And you see that, for example, Japan and European Union are pretty low. You can see that every time you buy a car in France, for example, that you are looking at these numbers and you get taxed if you do something which burns too much uh, fuel. But here you can see, for example, in the United States that the ratio is almost two. So uh, it's not a problem of technology here. It's a problem of politics. You have to decide you want to drive a small car or you want to drive a big car. So you see also where it's not only science. You know, there's also an impact on the politics, which is very strong. I'm going to take some, some, some words, because this is something you hear about on TV uh, almost every day at the moment, about the link between what we burn and the change of climate. This comes from a very good talk given by Professor Sawyer two years ago. And uh, Sawyer was basically addressing the question of the link between combustion science, what we do, and uh, climate. So um, just to remind you of a few facts, the, the idea that uh, combustion would change the climate is not you, new. Fourier, only two, two centuries ago, said that uh, this was possible, and Arrhenius, and you will see Arrhenius many times in the field of combustion. Arrhenius did a very simple computation. You can do that on one page. And he, he suggested that if you double the CO2, you change the radiation balance between the Earth and the sky. And then you can raise the temperature of the Earth by 5 degrees. Now, you can do that on one page. If you want to be more precise and take into account the ice, the atmosphere, the ocean, you take about two, three, four thousand 4,000 people on Earth. It's called GIEC here. And this, those are all people building models to predict climate. And, uh, but the conclusion is always the same. If you release CO2, you increase the temperature of the Earth. And of course, you know that uh, as the temperature of the Earth is going up, the place, for example, here where you find ice on the pole is shrinking, and the, the amount of ice which is left on the pole is going down. And you, you hear about this problem every day on TV. Now, the question is, are we responsible or not? Lots of people are showing you this curve. It shows that CO2 is increasing versus time. Okay? This curve, as itself, is not very impressive. This one is much more interesting. If you come back 10,000 years ago and you look at CO2, you can see that something is happening here. And what is the time here? Well, it's just the time when we started burning coal and then gas and gasoline and kerosene. It's difficult to explain that uh, this is not our fault. Okay? This is combustion. It's just no way out. And if you compute how much CO2 we release by combustion every day, you find exactly the slope which is here. So it's really a simple model. There's no big discussion about that. We are the cause of the problem. So we need to do better in the field of combustion.